This is WBCQ, bringing world's last chance radio to you from Monticello, Maine, USA. The heart longing of every Christian for the last 2,000 years has been to see the Saviour return and set up an everlasting kingdom on earth. Events in the world reveal that this will happen very soon. Keep listening to learn how you can spiritually prepare for Earth's final events. WLC Radio, preparing a people for life in Yahweh's earthly kingdom to be established upon Christ's imminent return. The Bible says that Yahweh is the same yesterday, today and tomorrow. So, is he okay with polygamy? Scripture records plenty of godly men who had more than one wife, not to mention multiple concubines. So, cultural differences aside, is polygamy morally acceptable? Hello, I'm Miles Roby, and you're listening to World's Last Chance Radio. I think most Christians today will denounce polygamy as morally wrong. After all, Yahuwah created Adam and Eve, not Adam and Eve and Betsy. But what does it say about Yahuwah and the value he places on women if scripture is silent on this subject? Or is it? A while ago, I asked Dave Wright if he could prepare a presentation on this subject, and I, for one, am looking forward to hearing what he has to say. Dave. Thanks, Miles. Um, Yes, I think this is an important topic to discuss. We need to have a clear understanding of Scripture's stance on this, because otherwise it's easy to read into it that Yahuwah perhaps values women less, and that's not true. Mm -hmm. Now, before we go on, however, I'd just like to add a word of caution to this. Some of the things covered in today's broadcast may not be appropriate for our younger listeners. Yeah, very good point. I know sometimes uh, home churching families listen to our broadcast for their worship service. Uh, it's a very, very good point to make. And at the very least, um, today's discussion might inspire some questions in younger listeners, uh, which the parents aren't quite ready to answer. Anyway, uh, you said something I found interesting, actually. You said that the idea that Scripture doesn't explicitly condemn polygamy might lead some to value women as less than. So what do you mean by that? Well, that realisation came about after hearing my daughter ask my wife why Yahuwah allowed polygamy. Most of the Bible stories revolve around men. There aren't really that many stories around women and girls. Yeah, there was the story of Esther, of course, and Ruth, uh, Mary, uh, Dorcas and Lydia, but I think that's about it, really. Yeah, so my daughter, who was about, well, I don't know, 12, 14 at the time, something like that, was feeling like Yahuwah doesn't value women as much as men due to the focus on men, as well as the apparent discrepancy in how men are treated versus how women are treated. Mm. Actually, I never really thought about it before that way, but I suppose, you know, I can see how it could come across that way. And, And just because as men, we don't see it that way, doesn't mean that it can't appear that way to women, that the Bible seems to favor the men. Right. Well, the fact of the matter is, I believe the Torah, which is the first five books of the Bible, remember, that's the books of Moses, does forbid polygamy. We just haven't recognised it due to an idiomatic phrase that we've translated literally rather than by definition. Honestly, truly hadn't thought about how it might appear to women, to be honest. And the reason I ask you to prepare this talk is that as more and more Christians are discovering that the divine law as recorded in Scripture is still binding, more and more are turning to the Old Testament for truths that have been lost or covered up forgotten. Believe it or not, there are actually people that are teaching that polygamy is morally acceptable because it's in Scripture. Well, so is murder, theft and rape, and that doesn't make it morally acceptable just because it appears in Scripture. Well, because it's allowed, I guess you could say. Yes, but it's not really allowed. I believe there is clear textual and historical evidence that polygamy was forbidden. Have you heard of a blog called Biblical Gender Roles? 
Biblical gen... No, <laughs> no. no, I don't think I have. It okay. doesn't sound familiar. Well, it's, it's Larry Solomon, uh, who I guess writes the blog and states, and, and I quote, get this right, God never condemned polygamy, but rather he regulated it, which means he approved of it, unquote. So that's the reasoning. Would you like another wife, Dave? <laughs> no. <laughs> the one I have is all I need. Which is a good answer, very good answer, to be honest. And I'll tell your wife, you don't have to sleep in the doghouse tonight. <laughs> uh, but in all seriousness, though, uh, I, I think he's got a point. Um, let me just find this. Just listen to this. It's uh, Exodus 21, verse 10. And it says, if he marries another woman, he must not deprive the first one of her food, clothing and marital rights. I mean, it's a fair point. I mean, there are no regulations regarding say, murder. It's just forbidden. So would Yar really regulate something if he weren't okay with it? Regulating something doesn't mean it's acceptable to Yar. Let's turn to Deuteronomy. Uh, Deuteronomy 23. Mm -hmm. And let's read verse 18. Because this is also talking about something that Yahuwah regulated. You shall not bring the wages of a harlot or the price of a dog to the house of Yahuwah your Eloah, for any vowed offering. For both of these are an abomination to Yahuwah, your Eloah. So here is a prohibition, a regulation, if you will. Mm -hmm. If you're vowed to make an offering to Yahuwah, that money is not to be drawn from the wages of a harlot or the price of a dog. Why? Because both are an abomination to Yah. That's a regulation. So just because something is regulated doesn't mean it's allowable. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. Besides, there are plenty of scholars who do believe that the Torah condemns polygamy. Let's just take a look at the evidence. Let's go to Leviticus chapter 18. Now, this is a chapter which covers the laws of sexual morality. Specifically, it delineates which sexual relations Yahweh outlawed. Okay, go ahead and start reading at verse 1, and we'll discuss it as you go along. Yahuwah said to Moses, Speak to the Israelites and say to them, I am the Yahuwah, your Eloah. You must not do as they do in Egypt, where you used to live, and you must not do as they do in the land of Canaan, where I am bringing you. Do not follow their practices. You must obey my laws and be careful to follow my decrees. I am Yahuwah, your Eloah. Keep my decrees and laws, for the person who obeys them will live by them. I am Yahuwah. So these are some very firm statements. The Israelites are not to adopt the lax sexual morals of the heathen. I find it interesting that in this handful of verses we've got here, Yahuwah keeps repeating, I am Yahuwah, your Eloah. It gives, it gives gravity, doesn't it, to his statements? Yes, indeed. I am your creator. You are yeah. to obey me. Yeah. Okay. All right, keep going. No one is to approach any close relative to have sexual relations. I am Yahuwah. Do not dishonor your father by having sexual relations with your mother. She is your mother. Do not have relations with her. Do not have sexual relations with your father's wife. That would dishonor your father. Do not have sexual relations with your sister, either your father's daughter or your mother's daughter, whether she was born in the same home or elsewhere. Marrying a close relative, even a parent or a sibling, was common practice in ancient Egypt, especially among royalty and the upper classes, and this kept the inheritance within the family. And Yahweh is telling his people that they are not to engage in such relationships. Now, we won't read all of it, but this passage spells out which relationships are to be considered unlawful. And these are commandments. Other translations translate these verses with thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not. Okay, let's just drop down there to verse 18, Miles, there. What does it say? Do not take your wife's sister as a rival wife and have sexual relations with her while your wife is living. Now, have you got another translation that you can read that in? Yeah, just give me a quick second or so. Um, just find it here. There we go. Nor shall you take a woman as a rival to her sister to uncover her nakedness while the other is alive. Another says, uh, there, Also, thou shalt not take a wife with her sister during her life to vex her in uncovering her shame upon her. All right, yes, that's good. It sounds like what Yahweh is condemning here is taking sister wives. Don't marry a woman and her sister because there will be jealousy and competition between them. 
Yeah, I mean, what happened when Jacob married Rachel and Leah? Uh, they, they did not have a happy home. No, they were constantly squabbling over supremacy. Mm. Genesis 30 actually records a negotiation between the sisters as to who got to have sex with Jacob that night versus who had to wait. Basically, Leah bought the right to have Jacob spend the night in her tent in exchange for doing Rachel a favour. In fact, those are the very words Leah uses when she tells Jacob he's spending the night with her. She tells him that she's hired him. It's totally messed up. That is it totally really is, up. yes, exactly. But the truth is, the dynamic would still have been just as messed up if the wives hadn't been sisters. Now, traditionally, Leviticus 18 verse 18 has been interpreted as a prohibition against sororal polygamy. In other words, you can't marry women who are sisters. If that is really what this text is saying, what's the implied extrapolation? Well, that polygamy itself is all right as long as your wives aren't sisters. Exactly right. So that's the implication. And that's what some people today who are trying to claim that polygamy is biblical are using to try to bolster their claim. Mm. And the point I want to make, however, is that there is both textual and historical evidence that this verse is actually outlawing polygamy itself. It's not just outlawing polygamy with sisters, it's prohibiting more than one wife at all. Okay, so where are you getting at that then? So not not that I want to take in on another wife, by the way, just, just to point, <laughs> point that out. But I'm, I'm not seeing that in this verse. Well, we'll get to that. First, though, I want to take a look at the historical evidence. The Jews have commentaries stemming from ancient times on all the Old Testament passages, particularly the Torah. These were originally oral traditions that were later written down. And there is at least one Jewish community from around the time of Christ that interpreted this passage as outlawing polygamy. And where there's one, you know there's likely more. So which community was this one then? Have you heard of Qumran? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, wasn't that where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found? It was in some caves. Yes, it, it was. But there's more. There was also a Jewish community there on a plateau. Now, I'm guessing that they were the ones who buried the scrolls in the caves when right. they became too old and fragile for handling. Anyway, some scholars believe that the community was home to some Essenes. The Essenes were a conservative sect of Jews. According to the first century Jewish historian Josephus, the Essenes numbered in the thousands throughout Judea. Among the Dead Sea Scroll collection, there's one called the Temple Scroll. In this scroll, the commentary points to Leviticus 18.18 18 as proof that polygamy has always been unlawful in Yahweh's estimation. Now, do you see that white book there with a photo of some scroll fragments on it? Yes. Yes, uh, this one over here. That's right. We'll just turn there to where it's paper clipped. Okay. And this is a translation of the Dead Sea Scrolls by Michael Wise, Martin Abegg, and Edward Cook. So you'll see the bracketed quote there. And when you've got it, could you just read it for us, please? Yes, yeah, sure. He may not take a wife from any of the nations. Rather, he must take himself a wife from his father's house. That is, from his father's family. He is not to take another wife in addition to her. No, she alone shall be with him as long as she lives. If she dies, then he may take himself another wife from his father's house. That is his family. This passage is again from the Temple Scroll and is actually expounding upon Deuteronomy 17 verses 14 to 20. But he's pointing to Leviticus 18.18 18 as supporting evidence that polygamy is wrong. What does Deuteronomy 17 say then? Well, why don't you go ahead and read it for us. It's verses 14 to 20, please. Okay. When you enter the land Yahuwah your Elohim is giving you and have taken possession of it and settled in it, and you say, let us set a king over us like all the nations around us, be sure to appoint over you a king Yahuwah your Elohim chooses. He must be from among your fellow Israelites. Do not place a foreigner over you, one who is not an Israelite. The king, moreover, must not acquire great numbers of horses for himself or make the people return to Egypt to get more of them, for Yahuwah has told you. You are not to go back that way again. He must not take many wives or his heart will be led astray. He must not accumulate large amounts of silver and gold. When he takes the throne of his kingdom, 
he is to write for himself on a scroll a copy of this law, taken from that of the Levitical priests. It is to be with him, and he is to read it all the days of his life, so that he may learn to revere Yahuwah his Eloah, and follow carefully all the words of this law and these decrees, and not consider himself better than his fellow Israelites, and turn from the law to the right or to the left. Then he and his descendants will reign a long time over his kingdom in Israel. Okay, now read the marked passage from the Temple Scroll again. He may not take a wife from any of the nations. Rather, he must take himself a wife from his father's house, that is, from his father's family. He is not to take another wife in addition to her. No, she alone shall be with him as long as she lives. If she dies, then he may take himself another wife from his father's house, that is, his family. So do you see the similarities here? Mm. When it says that he should marry from his father's family, it's not suggesting that literally. It's not advocating no. incest. No. It's an expansion of Deuteronomy 17, which states that the kings were to marry Israelites, not foreign women who would lead their hearts astray. Yeah, I mean, which is precisely what happened with Solomon. I mean, didn't he have, what, 700 wives and 300 concubines, something like that? Yeah, that, that sounds about right. And, and what did they do? Well, they turned his heart away from Yah. Exactly right. David Instone Brewer wrote a fascinating essay entitled Jesus' Old Testament Basis for Monogamy. In there, he refers to this very passage in the Temple Scroll, and I'd like you to read what he says. His essay was published in a book called The Old Testament in the New Testament. And you've got it there, Miles. So it's page 83. Yeah. And could you just read where I've marked it, please? And what does Instone Brewer have to say on the subject? So, uh, it says, The temple scroll says the king may only marry an Israelite and may only take one wife. In order to justify the interpretation, one wife rather than few wives, the temple scroll alludes to Leviticus 18.18 18 with the phrase, All the days of her life. Or, as our modern translations phrase it, do not take your wife's sister as a rival wife and have sexual relations with her while your wife is living. All the days of her life, while she's still living, it means the same thing. Mm -hmm. Now, what is interesting is that the Damascus document, which was found in K4 at Qumran, the Qumran community accuses their foes of being guilty of a variety of sins, one of which was, wait for it, mm -hmm. polygamy. Really? They referred to polygamy as a sin? They did. Here, just, I printed it off here. Read this. It's again from uh, the Michael Wise, Martin Abegg and Edward Cook translation. Right. And it says, uh, They are caught in two traps, fornication by taking two wives in their lifetimes. Although the principle of creation is male and female, he created them. In order to consider the taking of two wives, or bigamy, as a sin, you'd have to interpret Leviticus 18.18 18 as a command against all polygamy, not just the taking of sister wives. David Instone Brewer has another comment that I'd like you to read. Uh, mm -hmm. Just there at the bottom of page 85, you can see that. Uh, yes. The bracketed paragraph, please. And also it goes over to uh, page 86 too. Okay. The law of Leviticus 18.18, 18, according to the Qumram exegesis, concerns a man who has a wife and wants to take another, which is prohibited unless the first wife has died. We can see that this interpretation was in the minds of the Qumram exegesis in the way that they summarize the teaching of Leviticus 18.18 18, with the words, taking two wives during their lives. This phrase reminds the reader that Leviticus 18.18 18 is emphatically speaking about being married to two wives at once. This explanation is confirmed considerably by the Qumran texts, which show that divorce was permitted. Therefore, this exegetical argument does not prohibit divorce or remarriage at Qumran, but is directed solely at the practice of polygamy, which the Qumran exegetes considered to be unlawful. An exegete is a person, typically a biblical scholar, who skillfully and knowledgeably interprets or expounds on scripture. Instone Brewer is saying that the ancient Qumran scholars of Christ's day, and before in fact, were opposed to polygamy as being unlawful. This has led modern scholars to take another look at Leviticus 18 to see if it is consistent with scripture. 
Angelo Tossato is an Italian scholar who believes that the Qumran interpretation is valid. And I'd like you to read what he has to say. And this is from his article, The Law of Leviticus 1818, A Re-Examination. And what does it say? It says, quote, Qumram's interpretation of Leviticus 1818 is not only correct, but even more faithful to the original sense of the interpretation commonly given today. Unquote. It's very, very interesting. He says that, that it's more faithful to the original than how we interpret it today. So that's the historical evidence. Mm. Okay, right. Just got to stop you there for just a moment. We're going to take a quick break. But when we come back, let's get into the textual evidence then you said that you had. We'll be right back in a couple of seconds. Romans 1 verse 6 states that the gospel is for the Jew first and also for the Greek. Has that ever struck you as just wrong somehow? Like perhaps Yahweh plays favourites? Of course we know that Yahweh loves everyone and, as our Creator, He knows just how to reach each person on an individual level. Romans chapter 6 to 11 reveal an interesting play the Father has set in motion to win the Jews for Him. To learn more about Yahweh's loving plan to lead the Jews to salvation, look for the radio episode entitled, Does Yahweh Play Favourites? Learn what the divine plan is, so you can cooperate with heaven in leading many more souls to salvation. That's, Does Yahweh Play Favourites? Look for it on our website at worldslastchance.com. You can also listen to it on YouTube. OK, I'm, I'm looking forward to this. We believe you should take the Bible just as it reads. And if we're being honest, I have to admit that Leviticus 18.18, 18, when taken just as it reads, says literally not to take to wife two women who are sisters. So what is this textual evidence that proves Leviticus 18.18 18 is actually a prohibition of polygamy itself, not just sororal polygamy? You know what an idiom is, right? Yeah, yeah, of course. I mean, it's an expression used in a specific language that can't necessarily be understood by the definitions of the individual words. I mean, it's, a, it's a phrase or an expression that's uniquely understood to mean something. Right. For example, uh, Russian has an idiom that's literally translated is to look through one's fingers. So what does that mean? To be embarrassed, that kind of thing? You see, it's difficult to understand idioms that are translated directly. No, to look through one's fingers means to ignore something, or as we would say in English, to turn a blind eye to something. Ah, uh, right. And that's what we're dealing with in Leviticus 18.18. 18. When the translators came to this verse, they translated the words, not the meaning. And that's what's confused our understanding, because this verse contains an idiom. Okay, so what's the idiom here then? Well, I'm probably going to mangle the pronunciation here, but the phrase is Isa el achota. In English, we read it as Thou shalt not take a wife with her sister during her life to vex her. The idiom is a wife with her sister. So what does that mean? It's an idiom that refers to all women, to females in general. Richard Davison wrote a book called Flame of Yahweh, Sexuality in the Old Testament, in there, he points out that this idiom is used elsewhere in Scripture, and everywhere else it appears, it's always, quote, used idiomatically in the distributive sense of one in addition to another, and nowhere else refers to literal sisters. Does he give any examples then? Um, yes, he does, actually. Exodus 26, verses 3, 5, 6, and 17. You want to read all those? Now, just so that you know, Exodus 26, it's not speaking about women at all, but the feminine form of the idiom is used because in context, that is what is grammatically correct. OK, if you'd like to go ahead and read them for us. Now, look for phrases that are talking about one in addition to another, and that's where you'll find the idiom in the original. Five curtains shall be coupled one to another, and the other five curtains shall be coupled one to another. Fifty strings shalt thou make in one curtain, and fifty strings shalt thou make in the edge of the curtain, which is in the second coupling. The strings shall be one right against another. Thou shalt make also fifty tashes of gold, and couple the curtains one to another with the tashes, and it shall be one tabernacle. 
Okay, that's enough. We don't need to go through the whole thing. You get the idea, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Another passage there is the first chapter of Ezekiel. So if you could just go to verses 9 and Uh, 23. 23, okay. All right, verse 9 then. They were joined by their wings one to another, and when they went forth, they returned not, but everyone went straight forward. And verse 23... And under the firmament were their wings straight, the one toward the other. Everyone had two which covered them, and everyone had two which covered their bodies. Ezekiel 3 verse 13 says, quote, I heard also the noise of the wings of the beasts that touched one another, and the rattling of the wheels that were by them, even a noise of great rushing, unquote. So, We've got this idiom that everywhere else simply means one in addition to another. And yet in Leviticus 18, we take that literally to mean two literal sisters. Now, that doesn't really make sense. And it's not consistent either. The phrase has a masculine equivalent, which is ishal akiu, or something like that. It means literally a man to his brother. But again, it's an idiom that simply means one in addition to another. Mm. The phrase is used quite a number of times, but let's take a look at just one. Exodus 16, verse 15, and this is where the Israelites encounter manna for the first time. Mm -hmm. So Exodus 16, verse 15, what does it say? See if you can discover which English phrase comes from this idiom. Go ahead. So when the children of Israel saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. They're commenting to one another, What is this? It's not literally every man and his brother saying this to each other because not everyone saying that to each other were brothers. So if we're going to be consistent in how this phrase is used multiple other places, we have to interpret the phrase in Leviticus 18 as simply meaning don't marry any woman in addition to another, not just sisters. Yeah, it's a lot of sense, doesn't it? I mean, not to mention that it's more consistent with what we know of Yah's character. A point we're going to come back to. Dr. J. Sklar is an Old Testament scholar and dean of faculty at Covenant Theological Seminary in St. Louis in Missouri in the United States. He wrote a commentary on the book of Leviticus, and I'd like you to read his comment on Leviticus 18.18. Now, you can see it there where I've highlighted, Mm -hmm. Miles. If we interpret this Hebrew idiom in a way consistent with every other place it's used in the Old Testament, then, quote, Verse 18 would be prohibiting polygamy in general. Do not marry one woman in addition to another, unquote. Right. Now, another point to take into consideration is the reason for prohibiting taking another wife in Leviticus 18.18 is to prevent rivalry between the two women. And that would occur anyway between any two wives, sisters or not. So that's also consistent with the interpretation of this text as being against polygamy in general, not just sororal polygamy. Well, look at Hannah, wife of Elkanah, mother of Samuel. The Bible is clear that Penina, the second wife, was very cruel to Hannah because she had no children. Yes. In fact, the very words used in Leviticus 18.18, nor shall you take a woman as a rival to her sister, is the very same word used in 1 Samuel 1, verse 6, to describe Penina's treatment of Hannah. In fact, why don't you read that one for us? 1 Samuel 1, verse 6. And her adversary vexed her sore, for as much as she upbraided her, because Yahuwah had made her barren. There's not even a hint that Penina was Hannah's literal blood sister, but she is described as vexing Hannah, the very reason given in Leviticus 18.18 as to why a man should not take another wife. Now, here's another quote from Angelo Tassato's The Law of Leviticus 18.18. Could you just read that for us, please? It's just there. This motivation shows that the act legislated against is deemed criminal, not in itself, and thus it is not a case of an incestuous union, nor more generally of a sexual union retained intrinsically perverse. But it is deemed criminal in relation to the man's first wife who would be damaged. In addition, the harm which the law once avoided is such rivalry, enmity, that any woman, and not necessarily a sister of the first wife, is capable of causing. 
One point that has caused confusion is that the verses immediately preceding verse 18 are all focused on prohibiting incest. You're not to have sex with your daughter, your stepdaughter, your sister, your stepsister, your mom, or your stepmom. These are all prohibited relationships. So when we come to verse 18, it's been easy to assume that the sister being referred to is a literal sister. Yeah, I can see that, especially when you can't tell from the translation that an idiom is being used. So knowing that the previous verses are talking about close familial relationships, could you argue that despite the use of this idiomatic phrase in this instance, it's talking about literal sisters then? You could, but... Hebrew scholars tell us that in the original Hebrew, there is a clear literary break between verses 17 and verse 18. This doesn't appear in our modern English translation, but it's there in the original. So what you're saying is that Leviticus 18 covers two separate sets of laws then? Precisely. You see, the first set of laws up to verse 17 are commandments prohibiting all the different kinds of incestuous relationships. The second set of commands deals with laws regulating sexual morality in general. Verse 18 is part of this set of laws. In fact, let's take a moment just to read through that second set of laws and you'll see the difference. The first set again was prohibiting incest. The second set prohibits fornication of any sort. Okay, go ahead. It's verses 19 through to 24. Do not approach a woman to have sexual relations during the uncleanliness of her monthly period. Do not have sexual relations with your neighbor's wife and defile yourself with her. Do not give any of your children to be sacrificed to Molech, for you must not profane the name of your Elohim. I am Yahuwah. Do not have sexual relations with a man as one does with a woman. That is detestable. Do not have sexual relations with an animal and defile yourself with it. A woman must not present herself to an animal to have sexual relations with it. That is a perversion. Do not defile yourselves in any of these ways, because this is how the nations that I am going to drive out before you became defiled. These prohibitions, along with verse 18, all follow the literary break. You can see how they cover a different sort of prohibition. Paul Copan wrote an intriguing book called Is God a Moral Monster? Making Sense of the Old Testament God. That sounds interesting. I'd like to read it. Do you have it there? Sure, you can borrow it. Okay. Um, Anyway, it's interesting because I think a lot of Christians view Yahuwah of the Old Testament as being this harsh being, and he's not. Anyway, in this book, Copan has got some real insight into Leviticus 18, and I've printed off a section of it for you, Miles. Uh, You can borrow the whole book, of course, in due course, but would you just read this segment for us? Yeah, sure, no problems. Uh, Each verse in 7.17 begins identically as well. I mean, starting with the noun, the nakedness of, and it leads up to the command, you shall not uncover so-and-so nakedness. Uh, Also, in each of these verses, except verse 9, an explanation is given for the prohibition. Uh, For example, she is your mother. Uh, This explanation isn't found in verse 18, which we'd expect if it were an incest prohibition. By contrast, each verse, 18 to 23, begins with a different construction. Even if you don't read Hebrew, you can truly just glance at the text and immediately see the difference in structure, starting with verse 18. Verses 18 to 23 each begin with what's called the wow injunction, like our word and, followed by a different word than nakedness, ear what. Also, instead of the consistent use of the negative, lo, plus the verb uncover, to gala, from the root, gala. As in 7.17, here the negative particles are used before verbs other than uncover. And then he asks a penetrating question. Why are these contrasts important? And what is his answer? The next sentence... Uh, quote, in verses 6 to 17, we're dealing with kinship bonds, whilst verses 18 to 23 address prohibited sexual relations outside of kinship bonds, unquote. Uh, I see. That that makes total sense now. Now, are you ready for a bit of grammar? If Moses meant for Leviticus 18, verse 18, to be included in the prohibitions of incestuous relationships, not only would there not have been a literary break there, but he would have phrased it differently. And how do you mean? 
Well, he would have been clearer by using the conjunction and instead of the preposition to. He had the vocabulary to simply say, you shall not marry a woman and her sister. In fact, that's what he said in verse 17. You shall not uncover the nakedness of a woman and her daughter. Uncover the nakedness, of course, being a euphemism for having sex. You shall not have sex with a woman and her daughter. He could have used the same phraseology in verse 18, but he didn't. Here you are, there's another quote I printed off from Jay Sklar, and what does he say? He says, uh, he uses the phrase, a woman in addition to her sister, which was a common expression that did not refer to relatives except by coincidence, unquote. He's talking about the idiom here. Moses didn't need to use an idiom. In fact, he wouldn't have if he'd been speaking of literal sisters. OK, last point. Now, this is a big one. Verse 18 contains a time limitation. Read verse 18 again, and this time pay particular attention to the last phrase. Nor shall you take a woman as a rival to a sister to uncover her nakedness while the other is alive. That's a time limitation. You can marry again once the first wife has died, but not until then. There is nothing, absolutely nothing in the preceding verses that say you can have sex with your daughter or sister after a certain point in time. Instead, the prohibition is forever. Not so with verse 18. This supports the argument that verse 18 is a general prohibition against all polygamous relationships. Which makes a lot of sense. Let me ask you this, though. If the Torah in verse 18 were indeed prohibiting polygamy, why wasn't there any specified punishment for breaking that command then? I mean, there were clear punishments for fornication, adultery, breaking the Sabbath, etc. But why not for polygamy? Well, that's a fair question, actually. However, just because a civil punishment is not listed does not mean you can twist that into Yah giving permission or allowance for a certain act. For example, turn to the very next chapter, Leviticus yeah. chapter 19. Okay. Can you read verses 17 and 18? Okay. Um, you shall not hate your brother in your heart. You shall surely rebuke your neighbor and not bear sin because of him. You shall not take vengeance nor bear any grudge against the children of your people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am Yahuwah. There is no punishment prescribed for the sin of hating your brother, but that doesn't mean it's lawful. And how about the Tenth Commandment, Exodus chapter 20, verse 17? Uh -huh. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is your neighbor's. And this is one of the Ten Commandments. And yet there is no civil punishment recorded for the transgression of coveting but that doesn't invalidate it as a divine command. Which is a very, very good point. Truth is so logical. When you just sit down and look at all the evidence, it's so logical and consistent, of course. And it really makes sense that Yahweh would indeed condemn polygamy. Don't go away, folks. When we return, Dave will be answering a question about how to break generational curses. Stay tuned. You are listening to World's Last Chance Radio on WBCQ at 93.30 kHz on the 31 metre band. World's Last Chance Radio, preparing a people for the Saviour's soon return. Today's Daily Mailbag question is coming from the country that has one of the world's slowest internet download speeds. Ah, uh, Madagascar. Just pulling a name out of the hat there, I see. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, it's sort of, it's, it's far from everything, isn't it? It's like about 400 kilometres off the coast of Africa, something like that. Yeah, about that, but uh, <clears throat> no. Uh, this country's download speed is even slower than Madagascar. It's also slower than Kazakhstan and Vanuatu. Really? Oh, wow. I, I really have no idea. Well, I doubt you'd ever guess, actually, so I'll just tell you. Australia. No. 
seriously. <laughs> Shock horror. <laughs> Australia's internet download speed is slower than Kazakhstan or Madagascar. Yeah, yeah. Well, you see, Australia is its a wonderful country, as we know, with many amazing, beautiful, one-of-a-kind things going for it. But internet download speed isn't one of them. <laughs> That's interesting. Mm. I wonder why that is. So, having said all that, what is today's question? Uh, well, it's Samantha Hall from Cairns, and she has this to say. And she says, my cousin recently shared with me that she's been studying all about generational curses and how to break them. She's really focused on that and is really concerned that evil angels will continue to harass a family line unless and until a generational curse is broken. She says demons attach themselves to sinning parents and can, from that attachment, attach themselves to the next generation. So what are your thoughts on generational curses? Is this a real thing? Is this something believers should be concerned about? Mm, well, that is an interesting question. Well, there are two parts to my answer, in fact. First, okay. yes, there is a biblical precedent for a belief in generational curses. But secondly, they aren't something that we need to fear because Yahweh has all the power in the universe to break those curses. And I'm so glad to hear that, honestly. It never helps anyone to live in fear of the devil. No, indeed it doesn't. And in fact, focusing on our fears can have a very detrimental effect on our Christian walk. And we'll talk more about that in a moment. But to start with, let's take a look at what Scripture has to say about generational curses, because ignorance doesn't help us either. So, by way of looking at this, can you turn to Exodus chapter 20 yeah. and read the second commandment for us? Okay, uh, verses 4 to 6. You shall not make for yourself a carved image, any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or that is in earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them, nor serve them. For I, Yahweh, your Elohim, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me but showing mercy to thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. Here we have what you could call an explanation of a generational curse. Yahweh is saying he visits the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate him. And this is where we get the idea of a generational curse from. So in a limited sense, I agree with Samantha's sister-in-law. Yeah, you, you say in a limited sense then. So what do you mean by that? Are you defining generational curses differently from her cousin? Uh, yes, I believe so. Samantha's cousin believes that demons attach themselves to sinning parents and from that attachment, if the curse isn't broken, attach themselves to the children and so on and so forth from there, forming a multi-generational curse. Now, I don't believe that's how generational curses work. In fact, that definition of a generational curse actually contradicts other passages of Scripture. Let's take a look at some of those passages. So could you just turn back there to Ezekiel chapter 18 and read verse 20? There are a number of passages that teach this point, but I think Ezekiel 18.20 is probably the clearest. Okay. okay. The one who sins is the one who will die. The child will not share the guilt of the parent, nor will the parent share the guilt of the child. The righteousness of the righteous will be credited to them, and the wickedness of the wicked will be charged against them. So here Yahweh is explaining that children will not share the guilt of the parent's sins. Another translation is even more explicit. It says that the child shall not bear the iniquity of the parent. Iniquity is a premeditated sin. So to live in fear that a demon that attached itself to your parents or your grandparents or even your great-grandparents is somehow still attached to you through no fault of your own other than to be born into that lineage is to contradict the principle that the scripture is teaching here. Yeah, I mean, this idea that demons would attach to a particular family line just doesn't sit right with me. I mean, we know Yahweh is a god of justice, how is it just to allow demons to harass later generations because of the choices of an ancestor? Well, it's not just or fair at all. What does Jeremiah chapter 9 verses 23 and 24 say of Yahweh? I will tell you in a second. It says, uh, Yahweh says, Let not the wise boast of their wisdom or the strong boast of their strength or the rich boast of their riches. But let the one who boasts boast about this, that they have the understanding to know me, that I am Yahweh, 
who exercises kindness, justice, and righteousness on earth. For in these I delight, declares Yahuwah. Not only does Yahuwah delight in justice, but he actively exercises justice. He is not going to allow demonic attachments of the sort that is scaring Samantha's cousin. Now you're in Jeremiah there. Just turn through to chapter 31 and read verses um, 29 and 30. This one has an interesting turn of phrase, but it still makes the point. In those days, people will no longer say, The parents have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. Instead, everyone will die for their own sin, whoever eats sour grapes. Their own teeth will be set on edge. So again, the point is being made that people are responsible for their own decisions and not held accountable for the sins of others. Well, I have to admit, that's more consistent with Yah's character of love than saying demons can attach themselves to children. I mean, that's just, well, that doesn't seem right, does it? But then, what does the second commandment mean when it talks about visiting the iniquity of the fathers unto the third and fourth generation then? Well, I think an excellent example that explains what Exodus 20 is talking about is found in the fact that the children of alcoholics are at a greater risk of becoming alcoholics themselves than children whose parents aren't alcoholics. Studies claim the risk is two to four times higher, even though fewer than half of the children actually do become alcoholics. Perhaps because they've seen and experienced for themselves how devastating it actually is. Certainly. Uh, there are many factors involved. It's more than just a chemical imbalance in the brain. Families tend to pass down their coping strategies to the next generation, both healthy and unhealthy. And that's why things like child and spousal abuse, verbal abuse, obesity and drug abuse can run in families. This has to do with psychological and even scientific factors rather than demons. Will Satan take advantage? Sure, but we don't need to live in fear of him. That brings me to my next point. I see too many people living in fear of the devil and his demons. Are they more powerful than us? Yeah. Of course, but Yahweh is on our side. We don't need to live in fear of a fallen foe, and that's exactly what the devil and his angels are, fallen foes. When we have surrendered our hearts and our wills to our Heavenly Father, we don't need to live in the fear of the devil and his power. Turn to Romans chapter 8. This is one of my favourite passages in the entire Bible. Romans chapter 8, and can you read for us verses, well, just start at verse 31. What then shall we say in response to these things? If Yahuwah is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom Yahweh has chosen? It is Yah who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Yahushua who died, more than that, who was raised to life, is at the right hand of Yah and is also interceding for us. Satan and his minions can speak the words of condemnation. They can tempt, but they have no real power to actually condemn. Yahweh's power is so much greater, we have nothing to fear. James 4 verse 7, submit yourselves then to Yah, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Exactly. So with the definitions clarified of just what constitutes a generational curse, is there anything we can do to cooperate with Yahuwah in breaking these um, tendencies, I guess you could say, these tendencies or curses that run through some lineages? Because you have to admit that certain things do tend to run in some families, don't they? Sure, yes. Obesity runs in some families, and it's not all due to eating too much sugar. Some of it can be due to unhealthy coping mechanisms, comfort eating, that kind of thing. Well, prayer, of course. Pray and ask Yahuwah to lead your understanding in what specifically you can do to cooperate with him in learning how to disrupt dysfunctional behaviours and habits. Then, education. Don't be afraid to look up information online or read books that specifically address your individual situation. It doesn't honour Yahuwah for his people to be ignorant. If you grew up in a home where one parent beat the other, where inappropriate displays of anger were the norm, Study up on anger management skills. If a parent or both parents were abusive to you and you know you don't want to pass that kind of parenting on to your kids, read books on parenting. 
Of course, not all the advice in there is always good. So again, pray. Ask Yahuwah to impress on your mind the right information for your situation. Listen to that still, small voice of his spirit within. Take what is good and lay aside the rest. Exactly. Sin causes damage. It causes hurt. Dysfunction abounds, even among believers. But the thing I want to emphasize is that, number one, Yahuwah is there to help. We don't have to be defined by our past. Yahuwah can lead us, guide us, bring us the information that we need so as to not repeat the mistakes of the past, including mistakes made by our parents and grandparents. And number two, we don't have to live in fear of the devil. He can't attach demons to you based on the mistakes of your ancestors. He's a defeated foe, so let's rejoice in that. You've still got Romans 8 there. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Why don't you just finish the chapter for us? Uh, verse 35. Okay. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No. In all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of Yahuwah, that is in Christ Yahushua, our Lord. Amen. Up next, Elise O'Brien with today's Daily Promise. Hello, this is Elisa O'Brien with today's Daily Promise from Yah's Word. On November 2, 1734, a little boy was born in Pennsylvania Colony in New England. He was the sixth of what would eventually be 11 siblings. When he was 12, he was given his first rifle. By the time he was 15, Daniel, or Dan as his father called him, was known for his superior shooting skills. While still a young teen, he shot his first bear, a dangerous feat even for experienced hunters. When the local teacher expressed concern over how much school young Dan was missing, his father shrugged. Let the girls do the spelling, he said, and Dan will do the shooting. It was a skill he would use throughout his life. When Dan was 21, he married a tall, black-haired, black-eyed girl named Rebecca. As their family grew to eventually 10 children, Dan supported the family with his skills as a hunter and trapper. Like the sea captains who would leave for extended voyages, Dan would be gone on long hunting trips for months at a time. He would leave almost every autumn, returning in the spring with piles of pelts to be sold. On one such expedition, the tribe of Shawnee Indians adopted Dan and he lived with them for a couple of years. He always had great respect for Indians. Dan's wide-ranging explorations made him very knowledgeable of previously unexplored terrain. Dan was the first to blaze a trail through the mountains at the Cumberland Gap, opening up what would later become the state of Kentucky to settlers on the eastern seaboard who wanted to move west. Dan, or Daniel Boone as he is widely known, became famous even within his own lifetime for his exploits. Legends, not all of them accurate, grew up around him and became the basis for the mythos of the western frontiersman that has spread beyond the borders of the United States. In fact, I have a friend, an elderly German man who grew up reading stories of the American West totally fascinated by the idea of the Wild West and the men who tamed the wilderness. Once, Daniel Boone was asked if he'd ever been lost. I've never been lost, but I was bewildered once for three days, was his humorous response. I had to laugh when I read his reply. It's a great response, an empowering response, and I think that, as Christians, we can learn from it. There are times in life when we get bewildered. We're confused. We don't know which path to take. Whether it's an issue at school or work that we don't know how to handle, or maybe even a new concept we're not sure is true or false, we often find ourselves perplexed. When that happens, we need to stop, look, listen, and go. Stop what you're doing. Don't keep barging ahead. Take the time, even if it's just a moment, to pray for guidance. Then look. Look at Yah's leading and guidance in your past experiences. This will strengthen your faith, 
that He who has brought you thus far won't abandon you. It's important to remember how Yahweh has led us in the past. Then you're ready to listen. Listen for the gentle promptings of the still, small voice. It will never lead you astray, because that is the Spirit of Yahweh Himself guiding you. Then you are ready to go. Step out in faith, knowing you can trust Yahweh to keep you safe. Before Joshua led the children of Israel into Canaan, he was bewildered. The task seemed overwhelming. But the word from Yahweh was encouraging, and it contains promises for believers today. Yahweh told Joshua, Be strong and courageous, because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their ancestors to give them. Be strong and very courageous. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For Yahweh your Eloah will be with you wherever you go. We have been given great and precious promises. Go and start claiming. I just want to say I appreciate today's discussion. While polygamy has never been a temptation to me, my wife confessed to me that the fact that Yah seems okay with it has always you know, kind of bothered me. And and not just Solomon. You know, David had how many wives now? Eight. Eight, eight. And he was a man after Yah's own heart. And Abraham, he had three wives. Uh, not all at once. No, 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 absolutely, that's, that's true. But he had plenty of concubines, didn't he? So, yeah, I can see why it could appear that Yahuwah was all right with polygamy. It's really nice to see that he actually forbade it. Of course, Yahuwah doesn't need an apologist. He doesn't need us to twist the facts and make excuses for him. What's true today was true 500 years ago, was true 3,000 years ago. And that truth is that Yahuwah is a God that delights in justice, in fairness, the divine law is consistent with that, and if we want to be happy, we will surrender to bring our lives into alignment with his revealed will. Polygamy is inconsistent with Yah's original plan for marriage, so it's not really surprising then to find that the Torah condemns it. That's true. Well, our time's up. We hope you can join us again tomorrow, and until then, remember, Yahweh loves you, and he is safe to trust. listening to WLC Radio. World's Last Chance is committed to bringing the gospel of the Kingdom of Yah to the world. Prophecy and current events indicate the Saviour will return in the very near future. This will be followed by gifting the saints with immortality and setting up Yah's Kingdom here on earth. There's no time to waste. Accept the gift of salvation today and allow Yahweh to cover you with the righteousness of Christ. This program, as well as past episodes of Radio WLC, are available on our website at worldslastchance.com. Click on the Radio WLC icon at the top right of the homepage. Join us again tomorrow for another truth-filled message on WBCQ at 9330 kHz on the 31 meter band. WLC Radio, preparing a people for life in Yahweh's earthly kingdom to be established upon Christ's imminent return.